Welcome everyone to the uh, 2010 State of the Alzheimer's Disease uh, Research Center. Uh, appreciate everyone coming. Uh, we'll keep it informal, so if you have questions at any time, please uh, don't hesitate to raise your hand and I'll try to clarify things. Uh, just as a reminder, if everyone could take their uh, cell phones and pagers and put them on mute or vibrate, that'd be very helpful for the rest of us. Thank you. Here are my disclosures. Um, most of all of our research, of course, is funded by the National Institute on Aging. Uh, but we do receive uh, substantial support from other entities. Uh, and uh, I want to point this out, by the way. Uh, for uh, 15 years or so, uh, conflict of interest disclosures have been uh, linked to a significant involvement with uh, commercial enterprises, such as drug companies. And the uh, figure of uh, significant has been about $10,000 a year. Well, that's proposed now to change. I just uh, bring this up for everyone's attention. New guidelines developed by the public health system suggest that we'll be reporting more of our financial relationships, anything 5,000 or more should be reported. Uh, in the past, it's been up to the investigator to signify that this is a significant relationship, but now the institution under these proposals would make that distinction. And uh, significant disclosures now, at least for senior investigators, will be made public, be on a website maintained by the, P, uh, by the Public Health Service. So, uh, so just uh, FYI, these relationships may change. So people like Gene Rubin, who do lots of talks for drug companies, are just going to need to be uh, careful, <laughs> careful of these new uh, guidelines. So I try to update this periodically. I know I miss people, uh, so I apologize. Uh, for example, I know Murtis uh, Spencer is not on here. But this is a slide that I show in any, uh, pre any and all presentations that I give because uh, the kinds of things that we do together really are uh, collaborative and, and all of you should uh, do and, and should feel a, a real uh, ownership and a real stake in, in what we do. So let me start with my vision of the mission of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. In two words, it's to prevent Alzheimer's disease. That's our ultimate mission. Uh, more specifically, we maintain the original theme developed in 1984 and 1985 for the first major funded studies of dementia research at Washington University, and that is to characterize the clinical cognitive, behavioral, and biomedical correlates of Alzheimer's disease in comparison with healthy aging. Over the years, of course, we've refined this and now we are uh, eva developing and evaluating biomarkers of preclinical Alzheimer's disease, including biomarkers of the disease before symptoms appear. We want to determine the pathology and the sequence of pathology, the chronology of these changes in the brain. And of course, ultimately, the goal is to take these, uh, the, the knowledge that we gain from this and help uh, develop and uh, evaluate and, ho and hopefully uh, promote uh, therapies that provide true benefit to individuals affected by the disorder. Uh, to that end, at least at present, we are conducting these uh, clinical trials in the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. They all are related, uh, they all uh, are related to amyloid beta as the therapeutic target. Uh, immunotherapeutic approaches, both active uh, immunization and passive immunization, uh, and then two uh, gamma secretase inhibitor studies. I think all of us who have been in the uh, field for some time uh, recognize that, uh, that we need, uh, certainly need better drugs than those that we have at present for the symptomatic therapy of Alzheimer's disease. The big question in the field is whether a single monotherapy, such as something directed against uh, amyloid beta, will be effective. And I think our uh, hypothesis would be by the time symptoms occur, no, will not be. We will need multiple drugs and even then may not be uh, effective because by the time symptoms occur, the brain already in some areas is irreversibly damaged. 
So it's possible that monotherapies, again, particularly those directed against amyloid beta, may be effective, but if so, at an earlier stage prior to symptoms, before uh, important uh, synaptic and neuronal damage has occurred. So I think our theme of preventing uh, Alzheimer's disease is very much uh, a topic among a pharmaceutical in uh, industry about uh, what the best opportunity to try to utilize the currently available agents when is the proper therapeutic window, and it may be before symptoms occur. So the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, I think uh, I'd like to show this slide, uh, uh, really has benefited uh, throughout the years by tremendous stability of uh, key individuals. Uh, Gene Johnson, myself, Martha Durant, Gene Rubin, Betsy Grant have been members of the Alzheimer's Center for 25 years since its inception. Mary Coates came the year after we were funded. Uh, Dave Holtzman, Allison Goat, Virginia Buckles came in the early 1990s. So, we have had key individuals here for a, a long period of time and a really collaborative and integrative uh, group. Transdisciplinary, I guess, is the new term for multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. And I think we are known um, uh, both internally and externally as being very collegial, collegial and very productive. We're also deep. So I chuckled when I showed this slide, leadership stability. If you look here, these were the core leaders at our last renewal, the last cycle of our uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center from 2005 and just ended in April 2010. And uh, I remain in this new cycle beginning uh, May of uh, last month, but all these other component leaders have been uh, transitioned into new leaders. So uh, the reason I put resilient is I think that the Alzheimer's Center didn't miss a beat uh, with we, when we had these leadership transitions, and it does uh, allow us an opportunity, of course, to uh, uh, encourage the careers of uh, people who are new to the center or are up and coming, uh, and we, um, uh, I think it's a tribute to the uh, resiliency of the uh, ADRC. Now, let me talk about two key departures, the first being Jim Galvin, who uh, left just um, uh, a few months ago for a position at uh, New York University. I think it's a terrific uh, opportunity for uh, Jim. Uh, he is a professor of neurology and psychiatry there. He is the associate director of their Alzheimer's Disease Center core uh, with the idea that he will succeed the current director, Steve Ferris, uh, probably within the next five years. And he's also director of medical operations of the Center for Excellence that was established at the School of Medicine. So it's great for Jim, and we're delighted uh, for his, uh, his new position. He played, of course, many roles here. He, in many ways, was my right-hand uh, person in the clinical core for, for many years, and uh, just recently had taken over leadership of the Education Corps and its rural satellite. Uh, we, don't ha we have not yet identified a successor for those roles for Jim, nor for the uh, faculty practice that we operate, the Memory Diagnostic Center. So for the time being, I'm the interim uh, director of those entities. But Jim also played a role in our interactions with external multi-center uh, in initiatives, such as the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study, and Randy Bateman uh, kindly has agreed to uh, take over Jim's uh, uh, position on the executive committee of the ADCS. And Bo Ansis has uh, kindly agreed to take over the uh, representation of Washington University as a performance site in the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, or ADNI. So that's, uh, that's uh, Jim's uh, uh, departure has uh, opened the door, if you will, for Randy and Bo to take on uh, additional responsibilities within the Alzheimer's Center. Then I think uh, everyone here knows that uh, Mark Minton is uh, uh, also leaving. Uh, he um, uh, is also an example of how when one person leaves, uh, the door opens for someone else because he became the imaging core director of, uh, we house that core within our program project, uh, HASD, Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia. He took over uh, when Randy Buckner left. Some of you remember the uh, concern when Randy left whether we would find uh, leadership for the 
uh, Imaging Corps, and Mark uh, stepped right in. It was exquisite timing because we were just ramping up our uh, pet PIB studies, and Mark was the person who was spearheading that, so it was really uh, terrific to have him uh, engaged. And uh, we also benefited by the fact that Denise Head was willing to uh, be co-leader of the Imaging Corps with Mark and with a particular uh, uh, portfolio uh, dealing with magnetic uh, resonance imaging and volumetric change. So it's been the core didn't miss a beat after Randy Buckner's uh, departure. The concern now, of course, is what's going to happen after Mark has left. The core in five years has been very, very productive. We just had last month a a thousand PIB party because we've finished our thousandth PIB scan here at Washington University. Uh, Mark is going to uh, industry, uh, Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals, interested in developing amyloid imaging tracers as well as many other tracers. And I'm very pleased to announce that although all the I's have not been dotted nor all the T's crossed, that uh, Tammy Benzinger, who has been associated with Mark increasingly in Alzheimer's disease imaging studies in the past a few years, has agreed to become a core leader. Uh, we are uh, again delighted that uh, Denise Head will continue to provide leadership continuity as she remains co-leader. And uh, we're also uh, pleased to in, uh, welcome back uh, Mark Rakel. Mark, uh, of course, is a, a person of uh, international renown in terms of uh, uh, functional imaging and uh, aging and Alzheimer's disease and was really a uh, project leader in the very first uh, healthy aging and senile dementia program project that we had. He headed project three looking at cerebral hemodynamics so uh, he is very eager to get back in a, in a big way in the Alzheimer's Center and Mark's departure opens the door for him. Now Mark is also still interested in uh, our studies and so has negotiated a part-time faculty position even though he'll be in Philadelphia, he'll still uh, remain at least uh, to some percent uh, with us including uh, dedicated uh, uh, time for the uh, ADRC uh, and he's going to participate in important uh, reviews and so forth. But uh, we're most delighted that uh, uh, we think we have the opportunity to, uh, to weather uh, Mark's departure and actually to build beyond that with uh, Tammy, Denise, and Mark. But of course the imaging staff is really uh, remarkable and uh, we're delighted that they're going to remain and keep the operations going at the uh, extremely high level that uh, they do. So we're uh, very grateful for that. So let me talk a little bit about the organization of the Alzheimer's Center. We've been funded continuously by NIA since 1985. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, this is the only center that uh, has developed all of its major grants uh, to be very well integrated one with the other. So we have uh, four major grants. One is called Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia. It's looking at the indicators, the brain changes of Alzheimer's disease in healthy people with an idea that people who do develop those brain changes are at very high risk of becoming demented within a few years. The adult children study is basically uh, offshoot of healthy aging and senile dementia but asks the question, well if there are changes that predict who will become demented, when in the lifespan do those changes begin? So we look at middle-aged people in in the adult children study and then dominantly inherited Alzheimer network is an offshoot of the adult children study, a very special group of adult children, those who had a parent with Alzheimer's disease uh, but it, uh, the parent had a causative mutation so the children have a 50-50 chance of being a mutation carrier themselves. All of the evaluations for all of these projects are done in one uh, site, the Memory and Aging Project when we try, uh, uh, we, we do uh, give uniform assessments so that uh, the data can be uh, combined across, uh, across programs. This is a complicated, but this is the uh, organizational chart of our four major grants. We have four cores that uh, serve uh, all four grants. Uh, here's the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia Adult Children's Study, and Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer Network. I'll talk briefly about each of these. The ADRC is the name, I think, the umbrella under which we subsume all of these. Certainly to the outside world, I'll talk about some of the 
uh, some of these uh, entities here, but uh, we're known as the ADRC, but I want everyone to know that really is this uh, interwoven uh, uh, scientific enterprise with four major uh, grants uh, funding it that uh, fuel the Alzheimer's Center work. So here are the uh, uh, annual totals in both uh, total costs and then direct costs for each of these grants as of May, as of, May of uh, last month. So annual awards. So in aggregate, if we look at it, in total cost, a little over $9 million a year, and in, in direct cost, a little over $6.5 million a year. Uh, these grants support part, of, at least part of the salary of 116 people, uh, including 34 faculty and 82 staff, and 44 of those 116 people are fully supported by the ADRC. So we have, a, have an impact uh, uh, here at Washington University. Here is the current uh, lineup of projects under healthy aging and senile dementia, uh, post-stroke dementia, uh, biomarkers, uh, attentional profiles, and uh, using, um, uh, uh, using our uh, techniques to identify the relationship between genetic polymorphism and risk factors for uh, biomarker expression, supported by uh, the four regular cores that I mentioned and then the neuroimaging core. So healthy aging and senile dementia actually uh, was uh, preceded uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center here at Washington University. University. It was the first multi-center uh, project funded in 1984. Uh, the post-stroke dementia project is now uh, actually getting a real traction and Peggy Kelly is our nurse coordinator and does a terrific job. And as I mentioned, I think it is the parent of the adult children's study. So here's the current lineup for the adult children's study. You see that uh, post-stroke dementia was in healthy aging and senile dementia, but we're looking at amyloid imaging in post-stroke dementia. And that's also what we're doing in the adult children's study cohort. Biomarkers again, uh, tensional profiles again, and here we're doing uh, neuro uh, MRI studies. We developed a biomarker core and a special project uh, uh, for uh, uh, mutation carriers. Now, the adult children's study is uh, pretty remarkable because these individuals all uh, uh, give uh, m much time to come and participate in the research studies, and of course they're quite uh, comprehensive, and they include uh, multiple imaging sessions, they include uh, lumbar puncture, and they include clinical and cognitive uh, assessments on, an, on a longitudinal basis, and these are people 45 and up, have families or have employment, and so they really are quite uh, remarkable. You might say, well, if I had a parent who had Alzheimer's disease, I'd be motivated to participate in research, and we wanted 120 individuals to uh, be enrolled in this study, about 40 per each decade from 45 to 54, 55 to 64, 65 to 74, and we over-recruited because of the demand. But you might say we'd really have a terrible time recruiting individuals to participate in this who did not have a family history of Alzheimer's. Why would they subject themselves to ongoing research that is really quite comprehensive and uh, time-consuming if they didn't have a stake in it? And uh, the reviewers of our first uh, uh, project were dubious that we could do this. And again, we wanted about 40 in each of these age groups. And we haven't quite reached that, but we're pretty, pretty good. So we wanted 120 overall. We've hit 113. And in three weeks, by the end of this particular funding cycle, uh, at the end of June, uh, Becky Fearberg assures me that we will have fulfilled 120 uh, as we promised. So uh, the adult children's study extends healthy aging and senile dementia, just looking at younger individuals. Uh, our renewal application to go the next five years is going to be reviewed on July the 26th. It would give us funding from uh, December through uh, November of uh, 2015. This is the renewal, the lineup of projects in the renewal. Uh, we're looking at the growth of amyloid using amyloid imaging. We're continuing the bio CSF biomarker studies, the attentional and behavioral markers, and Tammy Benzinger now has a neuroimaging uh, component in, in the proposed renewal. Here's the review panel that will be doing a tele-review with us on July the 26th. Uh, some of these people I do not know, 
A matter of fact, that's probably why it took a long time to assemble this uh, roster because I'm in conflict with, with many people. But uh, Ron, uh, uh, Ron Kiliani, Richard uh, King, uh, Mark uh, Sager, and David Salmon, I think, uh, are, are well known and uh, should give us a very fair review. And uh, we've met uh, Matt uh, Frosch, the chair, on several occasions. So dominantly inherited Alzheimer's network. This is the international consortium to enroll children of people who have a causative mutation for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it's funded for six years. Uh, the, uh, we began with English speaking sites in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia. And uh, the idea was to enroll 400 individuals of families uh, with a known mutation causing Alzheimer's disease. Presumably 200 would be mutation carriers, 200 uh, non-carriers for the sibling controls. So we got a slow start. For the first uh, over a year and a half, we enrolled only about 32 individuals. I think 16 of them, half of them were from here. But now all the sites are up and running. A lot of regulatory issues, a lot of international back and forth. So the first, uh, first uh, 18 or 19 months, only 32 people. In the last uh, two months or so, we've added 40 for a total of 72. We're still behind, but we're, I think, on the way. We likely will add another uh, site, uh, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we're going to uh, translate our protocols now that were established and can go beyond English speaking. A uh, number of our sites have a number of uh, Spanish individuals from Mexico at UCLA and the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico and Colombia. And just before the International Conference for uh, Alzheimer's Disease in Honolulu, the International Conference or ICAD begins July 10th, we're going to meet with all of our Diane investigators in a face-to-face -face meeting uh, and then uh, spend some of that time at a clinical trials committee meeting. Randy Bateman and uh, Anna Santa Cruz and, and others in the clinical core for Diane uh, and other uh, interested Diane investigators have been putting together a, a package and a, a protocol that would allow testing some of these uh, anti-amyloid strategies in pre-symptomatic individuals who carry a known mutation to see if we can delay or prevent the onset of symptoms. And uh, it's very exciting work that's uh, going to be going on in that regard. OK. So we have uh, numerous strengths within the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, at least as I see it, the faculty and staff, uh, our partners, and of course our participants and their families. Now, to put together and to conduct such a large uh, uh, body of work over so many years takes a really surpassing vision, uh, takes really keen intellect, and a stellar uh, scientific leadership. So I think we have to give, wait a minute, how did this? <laughs> That's not the slide I, this is the slide I wanted. All of you, all of you uh, provide all of those uh, attributes. So I think that really is. We really have a terrific group of uh, faculty and staff, very talented, very bright, and, and marked again by collaboration and collegiality. And not surprisingly, our uh, investigators get uh, many honors. Here are some, uh, and by the way, uh, if you're not listed here, it's because you didn't submit whatever honor you recently have to Barbie when she asked to, for information for the quarterly departmental newsletter. But these were gleaned from the last four issues. So Randy Bateman uh, was awarded the Innovation Award from the St. Louis Academy of Science. Uh, Dave Holtzman had an entire issue of U.S. News and World Report uh, devoted to his work. Uh, uh, I'm on the State Plan Task Force uh, along with uh, Carol Rodriguez from uh, the St. Louis chapter of the uh, Alzheimer's Association. Uh, I've been uh, uh, very honored and humbled to uh, be uh, the recipient of the Carl and Gertie Corey Faculty Award this year. Consuelo Wilkins uh, was named by the St. Louis Business Journal as one of the most influential persons under 40 in St. Louis and Kenji Zhang a faculty of the year in the Division of Biostatistics. This is just a small sampling, but just to give you a, a, a sense of uh, the, the really uh, wonderful group of people we have uh, uh, together here under the uh, umbrella of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. I mentioned partners. We have a lot of partners. Uh, 
since uh, Leonard Berg, my predecessor and my mentor, uh, began the program, we've had an incredibly uh, productive and uh, interactive uh, affiliation with the St. Louis chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. It continues uh, today. Uh, Joan D'Ambrose, the chapter president, is stepping down at the end of this month. But uh, just as I indicated in our transitions of leadership, uh, the transition of leadership of the St. Louis chapter is going to continue. And we have uh, representatives here. I see Jan and Jocelyn and Stacy, our new president. So if you'll stand and let us give you a round of applause. Uh, it was very clear uh, when we began, when I, uh, Gene Johnson and I took over the leadership from Leonard in the mid-1990s that uh, our participants, uh, as committed and as dedicated as they are, were uh, primarily Caucasian. And so we were learning about Alzheimer's disease uh, in whites. And we weren't really learning about Alzheimer's disease in uh, people from, uh, who were non-Caucasian. So, uh, ultimately, we uh, formed an African American Advisory Board that has been uh, just a remarkable asset to us in terms of improving our uh, cultural sensitivity and in being ambassadors for us in the community at large and in the African American community in particular. And uh, they are really uh, uh, one of the one of the treasures of the of the uh, Alzheimer's Disease uh, Research Center. Uh, I'm going to come back to them in just a moment. We have an internal ethics committee. Uh, I want to give a nod to uh, Gene Rubin, who has been our conscience uh, throughout uh, his uh, tenure at the ADRC and uh, at his uh, 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 very subtle and very uh, mild uh, suggestions. Uh, uh, ultimately, I decided we should have a group of volunteers advise us about e uh, ethical issues that come up in dealing with cognitively impaired individuals, people with gene mutations, conflict of interest resolution. And so our internal ethics committee, which I think is co-chaired by Terry Hosto and Becky Fearberg, are volunteers who have given us great advice over the years. Uh, the Friedman Center for Aging, uh, I hold the uh, endowed chair by, uh, from Harvey Friedman and, and his wife Doris May and the Center for Aging uh, just uh, concluded a very successful Friedman uh, conference on productive aging cross-cultural issues and has just yesterday launched its uh, summer uh, student uh, experience. Uh, we um, are very impressed at the quality of applications we get for uh, undergraduate students who are interested in research, interested in aging research from across the country to uh, come to uh, St. Louis for uh, two or so months, work with a mentor, and, uh, and develop a research uh, uh, initiative and uh, participate in that. And so they've just, uh, as I say, just arrived uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, they're led by our uh, Friedman Center for Aging uh, Mary Weiss, and she is um, uh, here, but I'd uh, ask the summer students, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but if you'd stand up and let us uh, recognize you. So if our Friedman students, if you'll stand up. And then, uh, uh, you know, I, a no, number of us serve on advisory committees, external advisory committees for other programs, other Alzheimer's centers, and you can tell the centers that uh, do well are supported by their institution. I, I can't tell you with the terrific support that we've had from Washington University, uh, from the Chancellor's office, from uh, Ch Chancellor Wrighton, from Dean Shapiro's office, and if I have one bit of advice to any of you who are interested in developing uh, an Alzheimer's disease research program or an Alzheimer's disease research center, my advice would be uh, choose an institution where your department chair is also interested in Alzheimer's disease research. <laughs> so Dave Holtzman has just been a terrific uh, supporter and uh, I, I, as I say, we really receive uh, just uh, 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 excellent support from Washington University. And this extends to uh, philanthropy. Uh, we have a, a very a talented and, uh, and a very hardworking uh, alumni and development uh, group of officers that David, uh, headed by David Blasingame. We're uh, very pleased that David Shear has been assigned to uh, help us in the Department of Virology and the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Uh, David just uh, walked in. I won't embarrass him, 
But uh, this uh, is a nice uh, lead to the fact that we have increased our philanthropy to the uh, tune of $15 million. That was announced uh, last month. Uh, this is a naming gift. That means uh, the Charles F. and Joe, Ch Chuck and Joanne Knight are providing the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center with a total of $15 million, of which a substantial sum will go to endow the center so that the center from now on will have the income a annually from that endowment and that provides us with uh, stability so we can smooth over uh, difficult times. Hopefully we won't need to uh, smooth over difficult times, but uh, this is very, very much appreciated, very reassuring. I point out, however, that a stipulation of this naming gift is that this endowment not be the sole support of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Matter of fact, if we lose our funding support for any length of time, this gift is voided. So the Knights, quite appropriately, don't want us to become fat cats and relax and not work and continue to do meritorious work that receives external funding. This is an aid, not the sole support. So we cannot rely on this to, uh, to keep us going uh, without external funding. There will be a ceremony, I'm not sure that the date has been set, probably in September, uh, for a formal uh, a media type announcement for this uh, night gift, but we're very, very grateful to, uh, to the Knights. So I'm coming back to the African American Advisory Board. I've indicated that uh, they've given us very sage advice. Uh, sometimes pointed, sometimes always needed, and have been uh, great ambassadors uh, to the uh, uh, for the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center in the African American community. We've had three chairs: the founding chair, uh, Norman Say, and I'll come back to Norman in just a moment. He was succeeded by Bernice Thompson, and our current chair is Ida Goodwin Wolfock, and vice chair is Pastor Douglas Petty. Uh, and the other uh, members of the African American Advisory Board are listed here, and I will embarrass them and ask them to stand up so we can give them applause, please. And I, I, Ida is down here in front, she's waving her hand, and Doug just walked in in time to be embarrassed, so he's waving his hand over there. So Norman has uh, made a great difference in my life and uh, certainly in the life of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. So in 2006, at the time he, uh, he's still an active board member, but at the time he decided to relinquish his chairmanship of the African American Advisory Board, we established an annual lecture in his name. And uh, the uh, next uh, uh, Norman RSA lecture will be held uh, here. Uh, on October 5th, uh, 2010, uh, we have a cognitive uh, and neuropsychologist from the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Research Center in, in Chicago, uh, Lisa Barnes, has kindly agreed to be our fifth SAY lecturer. So I want you all to, um, to note that and uh, please uh, show up here um, and be certain to, uh, to come not only to hear a fantastic lecture but also to honor uh, Norman. I've told this story many times, but uh, when we started the African American Advisory Board, uh, Norman very graciously said if he's going to be a leader of the board and advise us, he should know what it is we're doing. So he volunteered as a research participant. And subsequently, he didn't want to do it, but he volunteered for lumbar puncture. And after his first visit, I was, you know, I'm, of course I'm very proud of our center and I wanted to hear from him about whether he was well treated, did he enjoy it, was it interesting? He said yes, yes, yes to all of that. But he said, you know what? I didn't see one person of color. So he pointed out that if we're going to make appropriate inroads into recruiting underrepresented minorities, we have to have people who look like the people we're trying to recruit. So we've made an effort in that regard, but uh, Norman is a special person and so just join me again in thanking Norman. So our participants and their families, remarkable. Any of you who have interacted with them know uh, what uh, interesting and, and really dedicated people they are. 
Uh, I show here some just some demographics of our older groups of people combined from healthy aging, senile dementia, and the ADRC cohorts, about 500 individuals. CDR0, for those of you who are unaware, are cognitively healthy people. And you see we actually now, uh, even though we are still an Alzheimer's disease research center, we have more healthy people than we do people who are mildly demented, CDR 0.5, and my, uh, very mildly demented, and then mildly demented CDR 1. So we have about 300 uh, healthy people and about 200 demented people. So this reflects our shift into trying to understand the antecedents to dementia and trying to ultimately prevent dementia. Our African American representation in this cohort overall is about 12%. Uh, so I mentioned earlier talented faculty, yes, no question about that. Uh, one way to measure that is productivity. One measure of productivity is scientific publications. In the past funding cycle we've had 462. Another way to measure productivity is our investment in uh, junior uh, individuals who, or people new to Washington University or new to Alzheimer research, pilot funding to get people started. And uh, we've funded, uh, uh, since 2004, 22 pilot grants. Uh, and these have uh, been amply uh, rewarded by uh, producing peer-reviewed publications and new grants. They've leveraged the pilot findings to help them develop uh, new external awards. Uh, so that's, a, that's another measure of the productivity. Matter of fact, two of the uh, current uh, uh, scientific projects in, the, in this new uh, uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center five-year budget period are from for, former uh, pilot grant awardees Randy Bateman and Tim Miller. Um, I'll just mention a few of the publications. I won't belabor any of them. Uh, these are for uh, just because I, I think you'll see that uh, we uh, uh, are uh, um, uh, among the world leaders, if not the world leader, in this antecedent biomarker uh, arena. Uh, so we know that uh, this pre-symptomatic or pre-clinical Alzheimer's disease, the brain changes in the absence of symptoms, is, uh, is a factor of increasing age and of APOE4 status. These are the two known risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. That may not seem surprising, but that is an important observation suggesting that the deposition of the brain changes and amyloid plaques is, is not, uh, not part of aging. It's part of the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Ann Fagan has shown that uh, a lowered amount of uh, amyloid beta is measured in the CSF, which is an indicator of preclinical Alzheimer's disease, is associated with brain shrinkage. The less A beta you have, the more atrophy you have in the brain. Martha Durant has showed in people who cognitively is not known to be demented, matter of fact, assessed in our program and said to be non-demented. But if you look back, the, those people who have amyloid in the brain as measured by CSF or amyloid imaging, they're already beginning cognitive decline. And also, Yvette uh, 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 Chalin has found that these same individuals have disrupted connectivity in the default mode uh, network. And uh, uh, Kathy Rowe and Mark Minton, myself and others, have shown that if you have uh, elevated uh, indicators of Alzheimer's disease, even when you're cognitively healthy, it does put you at great risk for developing cognitive impairment and dementia of the Alzheimer type. Importantly, uh, uh, Martha Durant, Jim Galvin, uh, and David Johnson, uh, and others showed that uh, the, the cognitive decline uh, really begins before we can make the diagnosis. There really is a preclinical Alzheimer's disease a signature. And uh, we make the diagnosis maybe two or three years after that de the cognitive decline begins. So it does give us a window of opportunity to uh, potentially intervene with medications. Kathy Rowe has uh, shown the, uh, uh, that people who have cancer are less likely to get Alzheimer's disease, and people who have Alzheimer's disease are less likely to get cancer, suggesting some inverse mechanistic relationship between the two. And then Allison Goat and her team, are, as I mentioned, are looking uh, for new uh, risk factors using uh, CSF markers as, uh, as endophenotypes. Uh, although this was not funded directly by, was, was not funded by the ADRC, uh, Dave Holtzman's lab has shown that uh, the release of amyloid from the synapse uh, can be regulated by the sleep-wake cycle in a neuropeptide or rexin. 
We get a lot of requests from outside investigators for access to our participants, for their data, and for their tissue. So here are all the requests. I won't belabor this. And also for imaging data. We've done training. These are different individuals who have uh, been either uh, postdoctoral fellows within the ADRC clinical core or appropriate laboratories and or are uh, mentees by uh, ADRC uh, of the ADRC faculty. So you see they've uh, virtually all gone on to faculty appointments in unless they're not uh, at that stage yet. And I would, uh, a remarkable group of people, I mentioned uh, how we're uh, interested and, and able to weather departures of people such as the stature of Mark Minton and Jim Galvin. It's because we have this cadre of individuals coming up. And just if you'll join me as of July 1, Kathy Rowe is going to be promoted to Assistant Professor of Neurology. So congratulations, Kathy. We do training with visiting scholars from across the world. You can see the countries and uh, not just, uh, not just uh, uh, doctor, doctoral uh, individuals, but also a wide range of individuals in nursing, gerontology, and social work. Uh, by the way, every two years we hold a Leonard Berg Symposium, fall of 2011. We don't have the date yet. It's going to be on preventing Alzheimer's disease. And our education corps, uh, staffed by uh, Barbie, who is the coordinator, and Murtis, who is the community outreach, uh, and Monique Williams, who is a terrific volunteer, provide training to uh, 25,000 people in the past, uh, past five years here in St. Louis. We're good citizens. We interact with uh, multi-site projects. I won't belabor this, but we do our work. We have challenges. So let me spend a little time on the challenges, at least as I see them. So we have four major grants, about, uh, what did I say, six and a half million dollars a year in direct cost. For a long time, Virginia Buckles was trying to be the ex uh, executive director for all of that. It became clear that she needed help. Um, it became clear because she refused to come to work until I said we can hire some <laughs> additional people. So we're very fortunate that uh, Krista Mulder uh, had decided to leave her uh, bench science research career and become an administrator and she joined us in January as an associate executive director and been a, a big, uh, a really big asset and I owe her a gr uh, gratitude for helping me with the, uh, developing this, uh, this presentation. Natalie Seltzer began uh, last fall. She's a uh, research associate. Uh, we needed help in the clinical core. Uh, Allison Brock and uh, Joyce Haney are uh, nurse clinicians. Uh, uh, we have two new uh, 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 MDs who are going to uh, have been and will be joining us to help with uh, clinical assessments. So one is Brian Di Sabato. She's uh, just finishing her psychiatry psychiatry residency. Will stay on as faculty in the Department of Psychiatry and begin in the Memory and Aging Project in August. Uh, and the other is Leah Givens, who has been with us now for uh, uh, nine months or so and uh, is already taken on a lion's share of the clinical assessments. In the Memory Diagnostic Center, Sharice Fisher is a medical assistant and also a, a wonderful uh, help in, in many regards, including doing psychometrics. Uh, we just uh, welcome Jennifer Fisher uh, Estep, uh, who is an, another research associate and, and in the short term at least is going to be helping us with psychometrics. Uh, Sue Leon, some of you may remember from the 1990s, was a nurse clinician. She's coming back. Uh, Rachel uh, Peasy just, uh, just uh, joined us as well and we'll be doing psychometrics. For you Friedman summer students, last year she was a summer student, uh, graduated college and now she's back in the Memory and Aging Project. And uh, just to let everyone know, Martha Sturant, who has been with the program along with Phil Miller, who's in the audience since the 70s when all of this was just developing, Martha has been really a, just a remarkable, is eventually going to retire. Matter of fact, she's in her phased retirement. And so we've been interested in finding a replacement for her and I'd like to announce, although once again the eyes haven't been dotted and the T's haven't been crossed, but verbally uh, Jason Hassenstab, who is finishing his uh, neuropsychology postdoctoral fellowship at Brown University, has agreed to come and, uh, and be our uh, neuropsychologist uh, and he will join us in September 2010. 
So we have a large staff. It's also a costly staff. I've mentioned that uh, we have MD uh, evaluators doing clinical assessments. Uh, unfortunately, uh, MDs are expensive. We get criticized in our budget for the expense. Uh, we think it's justified because of the uh, really remarkable uh, assessments that, uh, that our clinicians do. But we may have to increasingly utilize uh, non-MD uh, clinicians, nurses, and, and, and others, uh, because we may not be able to afford the level of uh, MD assessments that we do now. Uh, many of you know us in the uh, know our site at the Memory and Aging Project. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, wonderful. We I think moved there in 1996. It's been great, wonderful parking. We've outgrown it. Uh, matter of fact, several of our key components, our psychometric core, education core, no longer can be housed there. We don't have room for them. We don't have room for all of our trainees. So uh, with Dr. Holtzman's help, Virginia Buckles is uh, on the uh, investigation of a possible uh, new space for the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. We really need double the space that we have now. So hopefully uh, that will be resolved and resolved soon. Challenges at the National Institute on Aging. I mentioned at the outset, this is the agency that funds each of those four major grants. It's by far our major funding agency. You notice that this year they're only funding eight out of a hundred applications. It's very tight. This is the year that our adult children study program project grant is going to be evaluated. It will have to get a very good score to get funding. It's, a, it's really uh, ironic because I think that that is one if, of our most exciting uh, grants. So I hope it makes the funding level. It may not, but there's no relief in sight. And funding may e even be more difficult next year at the NIA. NIA in, in response is already cutting grants that it awards. So you, you apply for a grant for $250,000 for two years, you may get $200,000. If you're, if you're awarded, if you're one of the eight out of the 100 that gets awarded. They won't accept big grants. Big grants defined as $500,000 or more in direct costs. And that, of course, is important for our program projects, which, are, which all exceed that. And there's a new review mechanism uh, that's supposed to streamline the review process. It's just implemented in January. A lot of people are struggling with it. One of the limitations has been we've put our grant in in January, it won't get reviewed until July. We've done a lot in six months to address some of the weaknesses that were inherent when we wrote the grant. We'd like to give the reviewers supplemental information to show that we've met those challenges. Well, that's, that's being uh, sharply uh, limited. So we have uh, difficulties there. Then something that I think isn't uh, uh, maybe appreciated by many of you is we've had great friends in the National Institute on Aging our grants come out of the Division of Neuroscience at the NIA, and three of the four come from the, uh, from the uh, 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 Dementias of Aging section. The other is the ADRC, comes from the uh, Center uh, program. Well, Neil Buckholtz has been our program officer for Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia, Adult Children's Study, and Diane, he's retiring next year. He has identified a successor, John Shaw. Uh, I know uh, John a little bit, but uh, I will tell you that it's going to be very difficult to, for us to uh, have the type of relationship with John that we have had with Neil. Neil's been remarkably supportive, and at least as supportive has been the head of the Division of Neuroscience, Marcel morrison Bogorad, and she's stepping down also next year, and we don't know who her successor will be. So a very difficult funding climate and new leadership and for our, our program. So it's going to be, as I say, going to be a challenge. All of you who are supported by public health service funds, including NIH funds, must, uh, when you write your manuscripts, must have them submitted in guidelines to this public access policy, policy submitted to PubMed Central. One of the great things, I think, in and the ADRC is if you have questions about this, yes, our uh, library can be very helpful, but Natalie Selser is uh, very uh, up to date on all of this, and you all should utilize her to make sure it's done well. Please, please, please always cite the appropriate grant in any of your scientific output, manuscripts, posters, abstracts. It's the way the, the uh, NIA tracks our productivity. 
So I say we have 462 publications supported in the past five years. NIA, NIA may say it's only 200 because 262 didn't cite the grant. So you must cite the grants. Did I make that clear? Okay, you must cite the grants. And for us to track what's going on, we need a protocol number. I, we don't mean to be in any way uh, obstructive, but when you are asking for data to do even preliminary analyses, let us know so we can assign it the appropriate number so we can track it, track it appropriately. The world is going to change a little bit, I think, in terms of how people use the terms Alzheimer's disease, dementia of the Alzheimer type, probable Alzheimer's disease. These criteria are being uh, uh, studied by different, uh, different groups. Uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for the American Psychiatric Association has uh, rolled out its DSM-5, the fifth version of this, and they're suggesting that we don't use terms such as dementia. We, are, we use major neurocognitive disorder under which dementia and delirium are subsumed and minor neurocognitive disorder, which means basically mild cognitive impairment. Ron Peterson is on that committee. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the shift because we, we're accustomed to dementia of the Alzheimer type. The Neuro Neurology Institute, National Institute uh, of uh, Neurologic uh, and Communicative Disorders and Stroke, uh, NINCDS, along with the Alzheimer's Association, the, uh, had criteria produced in 1984, NINCDS ADRDA criteria for, alt for the clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, that needs to be revised, it's way out of date. Uh, there are three subcommittees working on different aspects of that. Dave is, Holtzman's on one, I'm on another. There's an Alliance for Aging Research that is interested in getting uh, more incorporation of biomarkers into clinical trials as selection criteria and possibly outcome criteria. And a white paper is being drafted. Uh, again, Dave and I are on that. And then industry, the pharmaceutical industry, has a coalition against major diseases that is looking at uh, aspects of uh, Alzheimer's disease from the cognitive status. How do we measure it? What are the measurements? Uh, or do, what do they mean? Imaging and biomarkers and Dave and I are on that too. So there will be changes in how we think of these diseases. So here's how I think of them, which unfortunately none of those four groups have adopted in their entirety. Uh, but I share them with you because I'd, first I'd like your feedback, and second I think we as an Alzheimer's Disease Center should be somewhat consistent in how we use these terms. So these are my ideas, you may not agree. Alzheimer's disease, I think, is the neurodegenerative brain disorder, regardless of whether there are symptoms, regardless of whether there's dementia or mild cognitive impairment. There's a pathology, that's Alzheimer's disease. It has two stages. One is there are no symptoms. That's the preclinical or pre-symptomatic stage. The second is there are symptoms. And the symptoms can be very mild. I would call that incipient. Others would call it mild cognitive impairment. And then if it's more overt, then that's dementia. So people talk about converting from mild cognitive impairment to symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. Well, that doesn't happen. The clinical course is continuous. It begins very mildly, but it continues to go down in a continuous fashion. It is not changing one day from mild cognitive impairment next day to Alzheimer's disease. It's the same process. This is very difficult, uh, this number four, because uh, people, including uh, Jason Hassenstab, who uh, will be our new neuropsychologist, are very accustomed to determining very early disease based on test performance, cognitive test performance. And while cognitive test performance is really informative, it's not going to be able to detect the earliest changes because the normative values determine whether people fall in the proper range or not, depends on age and education match controls. Normative values are taken from samples that have preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Remember I said, you have preclinical Alzheimer's disease, you're declining. So the, the norms are too low. Truly healthy aging is higher. And we want to get the earliest decline, we won't get it using norms, a neuropsychologic test. Salient feature of symptomatic Alzheimer's disease is intra-individual decline. It's how a person is doing now compared to how he or she was doing six months ago or a year ago, five years ago, in their cognitive abilities, and they have to have enough cognitive change that their everyday function is impaired at least to some degree. 
So these are the, the maxims that I present and uh, I hope that uh, we will get consensus around these. If you have improvements or objections, please let me know. So two slides left. Uh, I want to sum up the challenges that I see as most acute for the Alzheimer's Center. The funding climate at the NIA is very, very difficult. I'm very worried about the renewal of the adult children study. As, as marvelous a grant application as I think it is, it's just very difficult. We need space, as I've mentioned. And I'll tell you that we're often uh, ostracized a bit because of our clinical approach. Um, and this can color, uh, you know, I've heard people say there's something about the water, the Mississippi that makes everyone in St. Louis have Alzheimer's disease instead of mild cognitive impairment. Uh, but but uh, it's, it's not, not a different group of individuals, it's a different approach. And uh, it's ironic because everyone uses the clinical dementia rating, which originated here, and we've stayed true to the way it's supposed to be and everyone else has changed, but uh, they think we're the, the uh, unorthodox people. So just to let you know, the, to give you this uh, a sense of this, our summary statement for our Alzheimer's disease research center said that one of our weaknesses is we have poorly defined diagnostic classification. By that they mean we don't use the term myocognitive impairment. That makes data sharing problematic. That was the criticism. The same application showed that we get lots of requests to share data and tissue from investigators all over the world. So it's not problematic. I mean, we share, uh, if they didn't w like our classification system, they wouldn't ask for our tissue and our, and our data. So, it, but nonetheless, the perception is we're, uh, we're in one area and everyone else is, is in another area. So I'm sometimes, but not always, comforted by a quote from Bertrand Russell that we shouldn't fear to be different because every opinion now accepted was once considered uh, eccentric. Well, I want to close on a little more optimistic note. I think we as a center are really doing cutting edge science. And I think it's really critical science. It's really trying to prevent symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. I think that gives us the best chance of success. We always will want to take care of people who have symptomatic Alzheimer's disease, and I certainly hope we can develop effective treatments, even cures for them. But I think our best hope is to prevent it. We have all of you. There's not a better team of a better ADRC anywhere, and our participants, our in infrastructure, and our partners, the uh, St. Louis chapter of the Alzheimer's Station, the African American Advisory Board, and so on and so on, is just uh, unparalleled. And then there's our heritage. Now, several years ago, we had the 25th anniversary of the Memory and Aging Project, and I went back and looked at how everything began, and I was surprised, really, even though I was there for much of it 25 years ago, that much of what we're doing today was in those original applications in 1984. And that reminded me of the saying that all new ideas are plagiarism forgotten. And another way to say that is the secret to creativity is knowing how to hide your sources. <laughs> so Leonard Berg and, and Phil and Martha and the entire team really were working on the antecedents for all this uh, over two decades ago. So I think we also should acknowledge those who have gone before us. And of course the famous quote in many different iterations from Isaac Newton if I have seen farther than others, it's because I was standing on the shoulders of giants. And I think that's true. We always should remember uh, our heritage here. Now, 20 years from now, when I'm no longer here, if anyone wants to use a quote from me, <laughs> it would be this. If I have not seen as far as others, it's because giants were standing on my shoulders. <laughs> So, thank you very much. Everyone in this room, please join us outside. We're taking a group photo. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it.